Hi, I'm Glyn Jewis, and welcome to episode 15 <laughs> of my video podcast. Thanks, Dave. <laughs> Okay, so this episode is just going to be a little bit shorter than usual. We've had a few events happen this week, which has meant that uh, I've not been able to sit down for quite so long at the computer to record this. But nevertheless, I still want to get an episode out for you. So in this one, I'm going to do two things. We're first of all going to dive deep down into the hue and saturation adjustment. I want to kind of show you maybe just one or two things in there that you might not be aware of. So I suppose in a way it's kind of aimed more towards the basic or even intermediate kind of user of Photoshop. But I think it's always worth having a, a bit of a refresher anyway. And at the end, I'm just going to give you one little tip, like a little extra bonus tip to do with body reshaping. A really, really quick technique that I use, I'd say, on almost all of the pictures that I do when I'm working on bodybuilders and also female athletes as well. So let's dive in first of all, then look at the hue and saturation adjustment. Okay, so I'm gonna run really quickly through the hue and saturation adjustment because if you're anything like me, it was probably the first adjustment that you ever used when you first started using Photoshop for changing colors. And that's, I think, is because it's a, it's a pretty easy to understand dialog box and it does what it says on the tin. You move a slider and it changes colors. It's very, very easy to understand. So where do we find the hue and saturation adjustment? Well, first of all, we go to the top menu. We've got the image, adjustments, and hue and saturation. We can choose it from there. Now, you'll know that if you've watched any other videos that I've done, I'm really kind of talk about working non-destructively, where we can come back in later on and make any changes if we want to. Now, if we use the hue and saturation from the image menu here, this is actually working destructively. So what I mean is now I can change the color by moving the hue slider. So let's turn this apple to like this purpley kind of color here, click OK. You'll see in the layers panel now, there's nothing that I can actually change to make this go back to normal. If I want to make any changes later on, I've actually got to undo work and then redo it, which really isn't the best way to work. That's working destructively. So I very rarely, if ever, would choose the hue and saturation uh, adjustment from the image menu. The place I always like to get it is from over on the right hand side and I've got it just above my layers now. We've got all the adjustments here and these are adjustment layers. So you'll see when I click on the hue and saturation, it actually gives it a separate layer. So it's actually not working destructively, it's actually working separate away from my main image so that I can make changes later on. So that's one place you can find it. You can also find the hue and saturation at the bottom of your layers panel in this little drop down menu here where we've got all these different options. And again, halfway down, hue and saturation. So when we use this hue and saturation adjustment layer, we have a, uh, like I said, we have another layer. We've got a layer mask. We've got the dialog box up here, the properties dialog. And that's where we have uh, default settings in here. We can choose colors under the masters menu there. We've got the hue, saturation, and lightness sliders. We've got a colorize, and we've also got these two bars. Now, these two bars kind of confused me when I first started. But the way I like to think about it is this. The two bars are there for a specific reason. The top bar is basically showing the colors that are within your picture. This is the color wheel, and that will be remaining constant. That will never change. Imagine getting your left and right hand on either side of that multicolored bar here at the top and doing the strongman bit and bending it round so both ends meet. Basically, you've got a color wheel, but Photoshop and Adobe, they've put it into a straight line so it's really, really easy to understand. Now it's the bar underneath it is the one that changes. So what I mean by that is, if you just watch when I move the hue slider, look how the top bar stays the same, but the bottom, one, bottom bar even moves. Basically what that's saying is, when that moves, it's saying that, let's say we've got green here, when I move the slider, the greens have now changed the color below. So the bottom bar represents what the color has changed to. So we can see the green has changed this red, the red has changed to blue, and so on. The top bar remains the same, it's the bottom bar that moves. And if we want to get these sliders back to zero, we just double click on the name and you'll see that it resets it. Now, if I wanted to change the color of this apple from green to maybe red, so it's a red apple, what I could do is actually go to the master's dropdown and choose greens, and then use the hue slider to change the color. 
But what you'll notice is that this apple isn't entirely made up of pure green. There are other colours in there as well and we can see when we bring the slider over here only parts of the, the apple are going red and there's still some of remaining green. In fact that actually looks like a real apple colour there, quite impressed with that. But I want this to go completely red, so how do I do that without making a proper selection? Because this is how we can actually select areas without using the selection tools. So what I'll do is I'm going to double click on the hue slider. I'm still going to keep it in greens, but in fact I could use any colour here. But I'll, I'll just keep it simple, we'll choose greens because we've got a green apple. Now when you do that, what you'll notice on the bottom bars now, we've got these four markers. Two in the middle and two on the outer. And basically what these represent, the where we've got the ones in the middle, the colour in between those is the predominant colour we're going to change. The outside markers represent just a little bit of give and take either side, so a little bit of colours creeping in. It kind of like feathers out the selection if you like, so it's allowing a little bit more in either side. However, that might not be entirely accurate. We can also adjust these ourselves by clicking on them and changing them around. But one way to get a really accurate selection of all the green in this apple, so we can turn it to completely red, is by grabbing any of the outer sliders and dragging it over so they all bunch up together. Then we can use these colour samplers. I'm going to click on the one that's got a little plus symbol. I'm going to click on the apple and drag around inside of it. But when I do that, look what happens to these markers. You'll notice that they start to spread out. And basically what they're doing is they're moving wider and wider so that they basically encompass all the colours that go beneath my colour sampler. So it's going to pick up on all the colours that this apple is made of. So now it's done that, what I'm going to do is now use the hue slider and I'm going to drag it over to the left to turn this apple to red. And what you'll notice is the whole apple there goes red. So it's picked up on all the colours. So it's a very, very quick way of selecting an area and changing colour. So how can I use that in a pitch that I'm actually working on? Well, I've got one that I'm kind of working on at the moment. It's a work in progress on this incredible Hulk picture. And I've actually done, the obviously, the colour changing now. This is it before and this is it after. Now, to change it, I could have maybe made a selection of our model here, Steve, and then done the colouring. But I didn't need to do that because I had the hue and saturation adjustment. And this is how I did it. Let's just turn off the colouring for now. I'm going to go to the hue and saturation adjustment layer, just like I did before with the apple. And I'm going to look at his skin, and I'm going to probably say, I don't know, let's just choose reds from the drop down. But it doesn't matter what colour I choose from this drop down menu, because we're going to use a colour sampler and drag around. And these sliders are then going to separate so that they encompass all the colours that come beneath it. So let's just do that. Let's just drag one of these outside sliders, drag it across so they all bunch up together, like so. Then I'm going to click on the colour sample that's got the little plus symbol. I'm going to click down on Steve and I'm going to drag it around. And again, as I do that, you notice those sliders start to move apart. So now they're kind of representing the colours that are coming beneath my colour sampler as I drag around all over his skin, like so. So now that I've done that, they're nice and wide apart. It's telling me that the colours of Steve's skin are represented in between these markers. Now I can use the hue and saturation slider to change the colour of him. Now I could actually go one way and make him like he's something off Avatar, or we could go the other way and do it so that he's got that kind of powdery green look that I want to have for my final Hulk picture. And you'll see that the jeans still stay in the same, the same colour, blue. The background hasn't been affected whatsoever. And that's purely made a selection by me using the sliders here down the bottom, bunching them up, and then using the colour sampler to basically tell Photoshop what areas I want it to work on. So it's an incredibly fast way to work. Now, because this has come as a hue and saturation adjustment layer, with it comes a layer mask. So let's say if I just zoom in on Steve's face here, which has been changed by the way, it doesn't actually look like this, I don't want his teeth to be green and I certainly don't want the whites of his eyes to have any green in them as well. So what I can do is I can get a brush making sure that the foreground colour is black because we know that white reveals and black conceals and I can paint on this white layer mask with this black brush and take that colouring off his teeth. Obviously I can take my time and get it nice and accurate but just to show you how we can make adjustments by making selections first of all using the hue and saturation and then painting away areas we don't want by using the layer mask and the black brush.
Now one extra little thing on this is once you've changed the color, because this is a hue and saturation adjustment layer, it obviously has blend modes available to it. So if we just zoom out just a little bit, what we can also do is maybe change the blend mode of this because it's a color that we've added, we could actually change the blend mode to color. And you might find that that actually maps that color much better onto whatever it is that you've changed. Because I certainly think that now that I've changed this blend mode to color, it maps in better with the highlights and the shadows and looks a little bit more believable and realistic. As if a green man would be believable and realistic, but you know what I mean. It kind of maps in better with the contours, the shadows and the highlights. Hi, I'm Glenn Dewis, and I want to take just a few moments of your time to let you know about a full length downloadable tutorial I've recently added to my website called The Editor. Now the tutorial kicks off with a look behind the scenes so you get to see how the original photograph was taken, so you get an understanding of the lighting setup, camera settings, what kind of background to use and more before we then head over into Lightroom with the raw file and get to work on the retouching. We're going to go through preparing our raw file, cleaning up the image, improving the lighting, the colour, spot removal, skin retouching and then how to make the eyes really pop before taking things up a level and heading over into Photoshop. Now one thing to mention, if you don't use Lightroom that's absolutely no problem at all because everything can also be done in Camera Raw. Now once we're in Photoshop this is when we want to get to work on adding character depth and dimension as I show you how to use dodging and burning techniques on faces, how to add in that great looking coloured background and spotlight, how to add that painterly cartoon look, even how to make a cigar look like it's a light, smoking the healthy way or in other words the Photoshop way and much much more. Now the fantastic thing about this tutorial is that I show you how to work completely 100% non-destructively so that at any stage during the retouching or at a later date you can dive in and make changes without having to redo lots of work, saving you lots of time and frustration. Now also with this tutorial you get the original raw file so you can follow along which is definitely the best way to learn. You get the full layered Photoshop file, the final image plus a bonus video, not forgetting the 15 videos that takes you through the entire retouching from start to finish. So folks, that's the editor, the full length downloadable tutorial available now on my website, glyndewis.com. Okay, so now I just want to finish off with one real quick bonus tip or technique to show you something I do on a lot of physiques that I retouch. Now this is something I do a lot on, certainly on bodybuilders, to make them look a little bit bigger. But you'll see that you can also use it the other way to make it look so that somebody looks a little bit slimmer. But let me show you what I mean. Let's just go, double click on the hand tool here so we can see Steve here at full screen. Let's uh, turn off the colour and I'll show you the before and after. This is Steve for real, this is the out of camera shot and this is when it's got to this stage. But like I said, this is a work in progress at the minute. This is where it's actually gone to so far. So you can see I've obviously altered the size and shape of his head, but it's his body that I want you to look at. Because before I'd even done that, this is the out of camera shot of Steve, like I said. Steve's a big lad, he's an ex-American wrestler for WWE. So he's a big guy with a capital V for very. He's a really, really big guy but I wanted him to look even bigger. So what I can do, and obviously because this is done, doing uh, on the picture of the Hulk, it's gone over the top. But let me just show you what I do on normal physique retouching. What I would do is I'd probably do it at the very end of my retouching where I've done all the, you know, the dodging and burning, the sharpening, all that kind of stuff. But I'll just show you at this stage here. I'm gonna create a copy of it, and I'm gonna go to my free transform, edit, and free transform to get the transform handles here. Now I'm not actually gonna pull on these handles. The bit I'm interested in is right at the top of the screen where it says W for width. We've got width and we've got height. And I'm only gonna alter the width. At the moment it says 100. So that's 100% shown this is exactly how it was out of camera, 100% view. But what I can do is I can increase the width now and I drag with this little scrubby slider drag to the right to take it to around about 105, something like that. And then I'll click 
the little tick here to commit that and click OK like so. Now, if you look away from the screen and then look back at the picture of Steve, you wouldn't know that had been done. However, if I turn that layer on and off, you can see that it's almost like the original out of camera shot looks like the one that's been altered. The one afterwards when we've increased the width to maybe around about 105 looks realistic, but it's made him look bigger, but in a believable way. Now, the only thing with this is you can't generally go more than about 105. Any more than that, you're going to start to really stretch it out and distort it, and it's going to look obvious that you've done something. But generally, as a rule of thumb, when you want to increase the width of somebody, anything up to around about 105% on the width will work absolute wonders. So just as a recap, you go to Free Transform, and just at the top where it's got W, that's your width, and you can alter this by dragging it to the right, the scrubby slider, to increase the width of your bodybuilder, and they will absolutely love you, but just don't tell them you've done it. In fact, between me and you, don't tell any of the people that you know I've done pictures of that I've done this, because you can almost guarantee I've done it to every single one, but I daren't tell them. Now, on the opposite side, you might be working on pictures where the person you're retouching, you might want to make them just look a little bit narrower. So rather than dragging that slider to the right, you could actually go to the left to go to minus, and you can see that that actually makes them narrower. But again, you don't want to make changes of any more than 5%. Anything more than that, they'll look squished and it'll just look distorted and obvious that you've done something. So either way, to the left or to the right, to the plus or the minus, no more than 5% to make somebody bigger or smaller. Now, one final thing before I go, I mentioned that this was a work in progress, this picture of the Hulk, one that I'm working on over time now. It's a personal project, and you can actually see the progress and comment on it as well if you head over to my Behance website here, my Behance portfolio. So if you go to behance.net forward slash Glyn Jewish, you'll be able to follow, how, follow along here the things that I'm working on. I've got a portfolio, but when you go to my profile, there's also a work in progress tab, and that's where you're gonna see pictures that I'm working on behind the scenes, the kind of ones that I'm doing for fun, themed personal projects. And you see the Hulk one is in here, and what you can do when you go to this, you can actually start to see the images through the stages. And the great thing is, there's a lot of collaboration here, the creative industry yourself, you can all make comments to sort of maybe suggest things. And hey, I'll listen to anybody. I think everybody's got something they can bring to the table. And if you think that something doesn't quite look right, let me know and we'll just kind of work it in. This is all for fun, all collaborating, everybody joining in so that we can work through and create this final image, however long it takes, of the Hulk. And like I said before, there's also another one I'm working on as well, the Iron Man one. So feel free, join me over on behance.net forward slash Jewish and check out some of my work in progress. Okay, so thanks for checking out this particular episode. And as always, if you've got any questions or comments, tips, tricks, or techniques you'd like to see, drop me a line to glynn at glynnjewish.com. Make sure you subscribe to this channel, and you can do that by clicking on Dave's face right here. Make sure you click right on Dave's face, and then you'll never miss out on any of these episodes or any of the actual videos that I post out on my YouTube channel as extra bonus little things. In fact, when you go to YouTube having subscribed, you'll notice on the left-hand side, it'll say the number of how many new videos there are that are there, so instead of you having to sort of search around and look for them. But that's it for this week. Bye from me and bye from uh, the main man. Mr. Dave Clayton, I'll see you next time. <laughs>